give you an idea as to how the things evolved and how CSR responded to the need of the nation. So this is an overview of the intellectual property base of CSIR. We have, as of date, filed around 12,000 patent applications since our inception in India, of which around uh, 8,000, uh, a few less than 8,000, you can say 7,800 cases, cases have been granted. A similar number have been filed and granted abroad. So the portfolio includes both uh, enforced patents, that means which are currently in force, and the patent applications which are pending means they are still under prosecution either in India and abroad. This is the IP management policy of CSR, which is available on the IP website of CSR. Its basic point is to stimulate and, uh, stimulate and encourage creativity, develop skills among the scientists through the techno-legal business information contained in the document, use the information of the IP documents for to mount strategic R&D programs, manage the IP portfolio uh, as a business activity, manipulate defensively and aggressively for strategic and international s and collaborations, mobilize national and international thinking on IP-related issues and concerns. The importance of IPRs, let's see why IPRs are important. Anybody who has an innovation or an idea, if he doesn't secure the innovations by way of any of the intellectual property, can you just imagine, will it be able to reap any kind of revenue? No. If you have an invention, you do some research in the lab, publish a paper, or you write a blog or uh, write a thesis or a book, anybody in the world, whosoever is free to use that property because you don't have any rights on that intellect, intellect or that intellectual property. On the other hand, if you secure IPRs or IP for that innovation, you can license that, uh, excuse me, you can, you can license the technology to a company or a startup or an MSME or whosoever you like so that he may initiate the commercialization of that IP by way of technology transfer. This technology transfer leads to public use. Suppose you have made a device for harvesting uh, wheat, which can harvest wheat in a very small time, and uh, the uh, agro waste which is generated can also be disposed of, degraded by the use of the device. It's an arbitrary device. So if you just publish it, nobody will be able to take a license for that, and it will never come into public use as such with a competition. But if you have an IP, a company takes a tech transfer for that, it, uh, the public use is there, there is a revenue generation. So when you uh, tra transfer a technology, you always have some uh, guidelines for uh, payment sharing, royalty sharing. So as and when the unit is sold, you get a revenue out of the uh, sales. So that revenue is again pumped into the R&D cycle. So this is called the IP cycle. So to keep the cycle going, IP is essential. The benefits accrued by IP protection, some very uh, trivial example. Uh, can you just imagine the multi-billion dollar film recording publishing industry? Can it exist without a copyright protection? Or the rewards provided by the patent system as we have seen if I have developed a drug, a very uh, nice drug to combat cardiovascular diseases or to combat stroke or to obviate the para things like CNS breakdown. If I have developed a drug by investing huge amounts of money and uh, 10 years of my precious time and I just float that result or the uh, drug molecule in the market, can I just reap any benefit out of it? No. And nobody will ever uh, uh, fund me further to do research. However, on the contrary, if I take an IP for that drug, what I can do is I can license the drug to a good company. That company can effectively market and uh, produce the drug in the market so that the revenues earned can be shared by the patent holder. That means if I have spent $100 million to produce that drug in a period of 10 to 15 years, at least I get some money to pump again into my research cycle. Otherwise, I have no incentive to continue producing such good molecules. And without the trademark protection, do you have any reliability to buy a product confident confidently? The best example is like a smartphone. If you have four uh, mobile smartphones on a table and you don't have any label onto that, how would you decide which one to buy? As soon as the mark comes, Samsung, UI, I, Apple, uh, Micromax, Redmi, then according to your confidence in that company, you will choose the desired phone. That is the fun of a trademark. 
and uh, it's very important to know that if you have an uh, IT evaluation in a company or a um, startup, the most important and valuable part is the trademark aspect, like the Air India, the deal which Air India had, the maximum thing which carried uh, monetary benefit was the trademark, not that the uh, value of that Boeing or the jets which Air India has or the fleet or the tangibles which Air India has on the ground, but the mark that has been sold to Tatars. Intellectual property protection, these are the major two treaties. I've taken a very basic overview of the IPR. This is the Paris Convention. We have Paris Convention for protection of industrial property and Bern Convention for protection of literary and artistic works. All the treaties are administered by WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization headquartered at Geneva. So let's see this only, I have taken only one slide to describe what are the intellectual property types because the copyright is being taken by my other colleague. So intellectual property refers to the creation of mind. It uh, refers to patents, which is granted for invention, trademarks, which represent symbols, names, images, etc. Industrial designs for uh, objects like cars or uh, uh, your uh, water bottles, geographical indications of source like the Dharwar, Pera, Darjeeling tea, uh, rock, Rockford cheese, champagne, layout designs of integrated circuits for uh, IT related products and plant varieties. These uh, six categories of uh, IP are referred to as industrial property. Why? Because they can be made use of or they can be transferred to an industry for uh, for further purposes however copyright refers only to literary and artistic works and related rights to these popular works so let's come to patents i think i have 15 more minutes to go patent the patent life cycle as you see it's a very simple life cycle you have an invention you prepare an invention disclosure on the basis of which your attorney or your IP unit will prepare a patent application, you have to prepare that application, then file it with an appropriate IP office, wherever you desire to secure an IPR. For the Indian applicants, it is mandatory to file a patent application uh, in India they, and proceed they, and only then after filing in India, we can proceed to file abroad. If we don't do it, we have a fine and imprisonment either of them or both under section 39 of the patent act. So whenever you have a patent application, being an Indian applicant, you have to always file in India and then you can decide if you want to file it in PCT, US, EP, JP or any other jurisdiction outside India. That the patent application, wherever you file it, after filing it undergoes prosecution or examination by the patent office, respective patent office. For a single invention, if you have five in, uh, patent applications filed in different countries, it will undergo examination at five times in different countries. After the patent is prosecuted and it is granted, after the grant, it's like a, any other property, like you have a house. So once you have a house registered in your name, what do you do? Every year you have to pay a property tax for that house or your built, uh, commercial outlet to the government. So likewise for the patent, although it is in, intangible, but you have a property and you have to pay what is called the maintenance or the renewal fee to maintain it for a period of 20 years. So patent, what is a patent? Actually, how do we define a patent? A patent is a covenant between the, or an agreement between the government and the applicant, whereby in exchange of the inventor's complete disclosure, the government gives the inventor the right. So both ways they benefit. The uh, government shields the inventor by not letting other copy his invention and the inventor, how the government benefits, the inventor discloses his or her complete invention to the government so that the public can benefit at large. The property right provided in a patent is quite different from what we typically think of when we own a property. Like what is granted is not the right to make use. Government will not, if I manufacture a uh, patent a drug or a device for a CT scan, so the government will not ask me by giving a patent that you should make it, use it, or sell it. But the government will, on the other hand, stop others from making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing the invention. That is why it's called a negative right. 
the purpose of a patent is to provide an advantage to the society as a whole by rewarding the development of new invention it promotes technological advancement by how by stimulating research so developing innovating the drug is a risky and time consuming and expensive process therefore companies or organizations seek the protection of a patent to ensure that competitors will not immediately copy a product and the investment which they have done can be reaped in a stepwise manner so reasons for patenting why what is the importance of patenting you have exclusive rights you have an advantageous market position high returns on investment you have a licensing opportunity if, have, if only if and only if you have an ip you can license it then if you have an ip you can negotiate with the other company suppose the case of mpeg for technology it's not it's not possible to run a smartphone without an mpeg for technology but can any every company should uh, invent an mpeg for it's not possible even if they do it the first person has the right by way of an ipr so what the first person has done he has secured rights on that mpeg technology which is functional in so many smartphones and gadgets and whosoever is desirous of using that technology in his or her gadget will take a license from that company so he the person who has the ip has the power of negotiating it create for a corporate it creates a positive corporate image and it prevents others from taking advantage of your patented invention so the international treaties on patents the major ones are the paris convention for the protection of industrial property the patent cooperation treaty the patent law treaty budapest treaty and strasbourg agreement these five treaties particularly pertain to patents budapest treaty is very important it's for the uh, recognition of the deposit of microorganisms for a patent purpose if you are using a microorganism in an invention then you cannot just have an ipr on that first you have to deposit that microorganism in an international le recognized depository only then the patent office will grant a patent on that so now we have seen the importance so we should see what all can be patented a process for example any process of enzymatic catalysis or isolation of a microbe or isolation preparation of an extract from a plant a composition of matter for example a drug or an enzyme a machine which can be an nmr machine a spectrophotometer ct scan an article of manufacture like an electrophoretic apparatus or a water clarifier and any new and useful improvement to either of these so uh, options options to obtain a patent how can we uh, proceed to file a patent the first one as i told is should be the national route wherein the patent applications are filed individually at the national patent office for us indian nationals the indian patent office is our national patent office then we can have a regional route suppose i have a licensee in the european region so europe is a european patent office is a conglomerate of 37 european nations if you want to take ipr uh, patent protection in that area what you have to do is you have to file a unified patent application at the european patent office which is called the ep regional route the application is processed singly and the once it is prosecuted and granted you have to validate in the countries in which you desire it de uh, it depends where your licensee is where he is having his business so you don't want to spend so much of money in validating it in across all the countries of europe you can just choose at the time of validation then we have the pct route which is called the international route suppose i have developed a drug which can uh, treat alzheimers so it's a very wonderful drug you can imagine the uh, potential of that drug that how important the drug is and you want to protect that drug in many countries it's not possible for a person to file similar applications in all the 153 countries at one go so what we can do is the pct provides us a single window facility for patent protection uh, this is called the pct application and uh, during the processing of the pct application we have a time of 30 months to decide in which countries we have an interest in seeking ip protection so significance of ipr uh, this is just an example to make the talk interesting everybody in this talk must be having a smartphone so in a single smartphone there a single smartphone you can see how many type of iprs are there in a single smartphone the technical solutions by patents components patents 
manufacturing methods for the components they have a patent camera it is protected by patent lenses the composition of the lenses these or uh, any other lens it has the system for sending and receiving its uh, algorithm and something transmitters new area of use and the designs and other things are protected by the font logo display graphics so a single smartphone can be protect has to be protected by so many iprs a bundle of iprs a gillette razor which people use in day to day life can you imagine it has it has been protected by 53 different patents so when you license that razor to a company you have to license a bundle of 53 patents altogether so this is what i've taken from a report from dedrick and kramer based on the iits market tear down report of 2017 this is uh, this an illustration to sh uh, show you that in similar phones out of the total if the selling price of the good is 100 uh, dollars or 100 rupees then 12 to 11 to 12 percent is the ip share which too much and on that share the license the licensors licensors means one who has the technology and licenses and licensee is he who receives the license so the licensor suppose you are the um, ip holder so you are the licensor so you can get a revenue out of the sales of these products you can imagine the uh, the coca cola can is the best example of a licensing deal for the sale of each can of coca cola the person who has designed that can said i want a royalty of 1 cent 1 cent is nothing but imagine the amount which he is earning in crores millions of dollars every day so iprs are an essential tool for startups for a company which is so active in implementing ip solutions it helps them to identify novel innovations and increase their revenue a well defined ip goal achieves business objectives and makes you a leader in the marketplace it helps your growth in business revenues and explore new geography if you have ip in different countries you so you can have your startup established in different countries licensing of joint ventures you have a very good ip a very small one also but you know that it is critical for the functioning of a desktop so you can imagine the joint venture you can have with companies like dell hp lenovo and other companies which are manufacturing desktop because that technology which you have developed may be essential to function to function a new kind of a desktop and organizations patent portfolio is vital for its future success along its various ip assets such as designs trademarks and copyrights this is just a, a demographic detail so startups or msc's with registered iprs are more likely to receive funding A study released uh, reveals that SMEs and startups, which have at least one registered IP, are 21 percent more likely to experience a subsequent growth period and 10 percent more likely to become a high growth firm. Uh, this is just a depiction. Uh, this image is take, uh, taken from a WIPO report, which has said that this is the era of startups, and see in different sectors like healthcare, manufacturing, supply chain. retail and uh, energy natural resources and banking financial and uh, insurance sector see the amount of startups which are there so the maximum startups are in the bssi followed by healthcare manufacturing and supply chain are almost similar with retail but energy energy sector has no startup so the, you can also map your uh, domain of working by the such kind of analysis so this is the presence of startup in different geographies india is somewhere in between the maximum being in us followed by china for robotics not for any other but us you have a majority of startups in all fields uh, next year so in in the indian patents act and rules there are we have revised provisions of startups since 2017 so a startup means an entity in india recognized as a startup by the competent authority means the government under startup india initiative and in case of a foreign entity an entity fulfilling the criteria of turnover and period of incorporation as per the startup india initiative and submitting of a declaration to the defend so the facility of expedited examination has been provided to startup what does that mean since 2019 it has been provided it means that if you are in startup 
then you don't have to wait for a period of four years to get a patent application examined. You can immediately file a request for expedited examination. So the patent fees for startup has also been drastically reduced and made similar to that of a natural person or a small entity. Uh, for a filing a new patent application for organizations like CSR, we have to spend 8,000 rupees. But for startups, it is only 1,600. That is a slash term of 80%. Likewise, the request for examination fees for CSR is 20,000, but for startups, it's very less. So, uh, initiatives for Startup India program by the government are substantial fee reduction, 80% fee concession for patent applications, 50% for trademarks also. The Department for Promotion of Industry and Industrial Trade under the Ministry of uh, Industry and Commerce, they have for the launch of the SIPP, uh, they have the uh, facilitating startup. Wherein uh, at the website of uh, the Indian Patent Office, you have a list of patent facilitators who, who are there uh, appointed by the patent, Indian Patent Office to help the startup in drafting, filing, and prosecuting their patent application. So this is the statistics taken from the Indian Patent Office the annual report uh, 1920. Uh, applications filed by startup is 1652 out of the total 56,000. But if you can see, the numbers are gradually increasing. In 2016, the number was very low, 160. But in 1920, it's almost 10 times. So in the for the for the universities also, the uh, Indian Patent Office has made some amendments by the way of patent amendment rule 2021. So the university has been included under the amendment of rule 2CA wherein it has been included under the ambit of educational institution. And likewise, for the startup, the patent fees for universities also have been included. Suppose you are a university in Nagaland and you want to file, an patent for an, uh, file an application for a patent, so now you don't have to shell out 8,000 rupees, only 1,600 rupees for filing a new application and 4,000 for filing the request for examination. That's all. And uh, I'll welcome any questions if any... Thank you, madam. And, and any participant, uh, any participant can, participants can ask any questions. Um, but I think uh, we uh, the time is for the next session, and we will go for the social economic impact and benefits of GI. Yeah. Okay, thank you, ma'am. By Dr. Chitra, IP attorney partner. Ma'am, you can take your time. Economic better benefits of Joker of indicators of government of India. Uh, Chitra Arvind, Ufu, I could just see you. Uh, a very warm good afternoon to all of you. Uh, a very warm welcome yeah. and thanks for you know having me in this session. Uh, a very good afternoon to friends and family from Nagaland. I mentioned the word families even though I'm from South because I have been to Nagaland twice and all of you have opened your hearts and home to me, to my family, my six-year-old daughter there. So when I give this lecture and I think about this Azadika Amrit Mahotsav, I only see the connect that we have amongst ourselves as friends, as colleagues, and as family. So I really want you know, my friends and family in Nagaland to be benefited by the intellectual property rights and the various things that we have as India to have you know, and file geographical indications because Nagaland is very rich in geographical indications and benefit out of it. So let's see what are the benefits that we are going to have both in terms of social and in terms of you know um, economic benefits. How many of these products all of us recognize? Probably all of them. Darjeeling tea, coffee from Colombia, rasagulla, 
Switzerland cheese, the cheese with a hole. Basmati rice. Champagne, which we open every time that there's going to be a celebration. All of this we associate with the place of origin. It is similar when we say blue cheese, when we say Darjeeling tea, when we say cognac, scotch, porto, Havana, tequila. Every single thing when we say this name, we know from which area it comes from. So that is geographical indications. And geographical indication is the name which is associated to a good, which identifies the product of a certain nature. And it is known for its geographical origin. And the characteristics of the product are always associated with the source. Now let us see what is the definition of a geographical indication which is given in the act. So any goods which originates from a place and or manufactured in the territory of a country, a region or a locality in the region and when this good is associated with quality, reputation, to that particular geographical origin, we'll have to go and apply for a geographical origin. If you see our Trakisang songs from Nagaland, Kaisal, Bastar, all these are handicrafts and which can be associated with this particular region and they get protected under geographical indication. It is true for our agricultural products also including our Naga Mircha, Naga Tree Tomato, Naga Cucumber, and many other things. It's also possible for us to protect foodstuff like Rockford cheese and everything, which can be identified with the place of origin. It is similar for alcohol and alcoholic beverages like Scotch whiskey and everything. So summarizing, any goods which originate from a region and the name of the goods can be associated with a region, it becomes a geographical indication. But why should we protect geographical indication? How about our traditional knowledge? At one point of time, you know, we all had joined families with our grandmothers and grandfathers and our parents and children and everybody is sitting together. And every day, our grandparents used to tell us about what it is and what is our culture and heritage. But such societies are diminishing. How do you transmit the knowledge of our ancestors to our children? So when you file a geographical origin, you make a story and if not through oral, we document it as this is our tradition. It preserves the skill of the community. I have been around Nagaland and I see that, you know, people are weaving and, you know, they are taking a fiber from the thistle and they are breaking that fiber and making it into wonderful shawls. How do you transmit that knowledge and how do you preserve the skills of the old ladies and pass it on to our younger generation, to our girls? This shawl takes months for people to prepare. When you have months to prepare a shawl and you want to sell that shawl, should it not help it to bring in money and give sustenance to that particular person who has spent months in making the shawl? Otherwise, why would that person choose it as a profession or choose to continue doing it? It becomes a livelihood for that person. I have seen welfare societies. I have seen people associated with churches. And how do you bring in money for these people who want to spend their time preserving their culture and making shawls? It becomes, you know, a matter of livelihood. 
how do you prevent biopiracy? There has to be, like Mr. Rieshwan said, a framework around it. You have to know what to protect, how to protect, and that is how you prevent biopiracy. Any geographical indication has a lot of support, and that has to boost the export of that particular product. And when a product is exported, certainly the price range becomes different. And there has to be a sustainable development and the sustainable preservation of knowledge. Without this, it is quite difficult for us to preserve our knowledge, our community. The difference, major difference between geographical indication and other type of IP is that a geographical indication is for a community and not for any individuals. Individual means either you know, a company or an individual person, but GI is not so. GI is for the community. So how does a GI happen? First, you file an application. This file application, you have to talk about the heritage. You have to talk about it as to how the knowledge for which you are claiming a GI is associated with one particular place. Okay, and what is the history? We have to go, if it is oral, we have to document it. And this is the manner of preserving. And we have to tell people as to how this knowledge is associated with a community or is associated with a place or how the characteristics are attributable to the place of the origin. It can be a shawl, it can be an agricultural. But this application will go for a formal and a technical examination. Once it is done, it is entered and, you know, it's advertised. People can oppose it at this particular point of time. If there is no opposition or people are able to overcome the opposition, the applicant is able to overcome the opposition by any other third party, it gets registered. After rectification also, if some person has any grievance, they can file a rectification petition saying that, no, I, whatever reason may be. Then you, it becomes a registered GI. But see, a registered GI is held by one person. But many people of that community cannot be excluded or the intention of GI is not to exclude other people other than registered users. People who are all associated with that community, but who want to be associated with that particular product can become authorized users. But there, as any way, when there is an authorized user, there has to be rules and regulations as to how people produce and market the product without diluting or without hurting the sentiments of the GI per se. So who is an authorized user? Any person who produces makes, manufactures, trades, packages, or deals with a registered user of GI can apply to become an authorized user, okay? So we cannot exclude other people and everybody can be a part of it because it's a cognizance of people involved. But if the registered user can effectively manage the authorized user, then the quality of the GI and the knowledge is preserved intact and does not become diluted in any particular manner. So you have a GI owner in other manner. The GI owner is known as the registered user. Under the registered user, there can be other authorized users. And under one authorized user, there can be few other authorized users. But if you have an apex body or if there is a pyramidal structure, it becomes very 
easy for us to ensure that our GI is able to achieve a good reputation and a marketing status. So what is the path that you will walk in a GI? If you don't have a GI, what will happen? Nobody will understand the value of the product or the value of the knowledge which is associated with that particular GI. The product can be adulterated or the knowledge like in terms of, you know, uh, how to make a shawl, who is to wear the shawl, will all get diluted. And there will be consumer deception. And there is also damage to reputation and sensitization, lack of sensitization as to what this GI is in the rest of the places. So what do you do when you get a GI? When you get a GI, you get a statutory backup, which prevents misuse, abuse, and if anybody else is going into your GI, you can always sue for infringements. If the GI is administered correctly between the old and the authorized users, there becomes a supply chain integrity. And always it is possible for you to have a specialty logo which you can place on the GI and which becomes a source of identification. So what happens in this process of accumulation of knowledge and filing of a GI? Your product protected under GI becomes a brand. So it is conversion of a source of a product to a brand. Now you would ask me, well, do not brands get protected under trademarks? Yes, brands get protected under trademarks. Trademarks and GI are not the same, but it is possible for them to coexist in a different manner. And every time a GI will take precedence over trademark. But it is possible for us to do both so as to effectively protect your product. In a trademark, you can do a design, a symbol, a sign, and a word, which can be affixed on the product to trace the origin. But a GI is only a word, and this word has to help the people to identify the origin. A trademark covers both goods and services, but a GI is only mostly on goods. Generally, a trademark is owned by that legal entity, but a GI is always a collective knowledge. A GI can never be held by an independent entity. It can be held by the registered user and used by the registered user to identify the source and the origin. So there are different kinds of trademarks. How will you use these trademarks in combination with GI? So if it is an individual mark, it's just a mark which helps us to identify the product from that particular legal entity. But we can have a collective mark. Mostly the GI marks are a collective mark which can be used by the registered user of GI and also the authorized users who fall under the registered users. Then you will also have a certification mark which gives the quality and the nature of the products. Let us look at some of the individual masks, like a Coca-Cola. You know who is the owner of Coca-Cola and you will have an individual trademark for this. I'm sure all of you will identify the typical logo for Darjeeling mark. Okay, so when this gets affixed on your team, you know that, you know, that this is Darjeeling. Okay, this is Darjeeling tea. This is authentic. Okay, and I know if I have this mark, I do get only Darjeeling tea. This is a wool mark. Wool mark is a certification mark. For example, even your ISI mark is a certification mark, which certifies as to what is the quality of the product. If your collective mark is so good that it acquires the flavor of a certification mark and people who get this particular product 
will be assured of the source and of the quality. So as a GI, we have to ensure that we have a combination of both. And this particular combination, whatever is available, this combination needs to be done in a very nice and a collective manner. As I said, a GI is very important, especially in terms of collective knowledge to bring in the socio-economic advantages that we have. We need to protect and preserve our traditional knowledge. What better manner is it to do and collate all data under GI, including the history? If you don't file for GI, I'm sure you know, we may not make efforts to collate and document this knowledge. So for me, this is first. Otherwise, as we lose generations, we are going to lose the rich knowledge which is associated with the region, and therefore this must be encouraged. It's a public interest, okay? You do go to, you know, some shops, local shops across India, you're going to get products which are going to say they are not the shawls, but they are not, okay? But how do you ensure that? You have to ensure that you source and trace your supply chain. How about the empowerment of women? Most of these geographical indications, especially in terms of handicrafts, are handled by women. How do we ensure that we empower them? How do we ensure that we give them you know, enough source of income for that particular country or that particular region or that particular community? This is a way of doing it by enriching our people to know about GI, disperse the knowledge about GI, and ensure that they get benefited economically by them. As of now, most of them are home sectors. How do you make the home sectors into a fledgling industry at least, and convert that small fledgling industry to a multi-billion dollar business? Organization of the sector. Think of Amul. Think of how, you know, all the cows which were there and how the milk was collated and what is Amul today. It is an organization of the domestic sector. How will you disperse funds to the society at large? There needs to be an apex entity. Look at the people who are associated with Amul today and where they give milk to Amul today. Look at the status, economic status as to how it has grown from a small domestic household to a you know, middle income and senior income domestic household. So, and not only this, do we not want to tell a tradition across the globe? We need to. And that is why you need to go for a GI. Why is this discussion so important? I repeat. Geographical indication is by the people, for the people. I'm not reading out, you know, the words of Kennedy, but we must attempt to bring back people to community. As Mahatma Gandhi said, our lives lives in villages and our knowledge lives in villages. So in the 75th independence, anniversary. I request that we all reach out to our community and start collating this knowledge and protect it by way of GI. Look at the economic benefits. It's not only in our social, it's also economic. Let's look at champagne. Before GI, it was $12. It's $40 after a GI has been filed. Look at Antigua coffee beans. 0.5 came to 1.5. That's a 200% growth. This is true for Jamal coffee also. Unfortunately, in India, the price rise between, you know, before and after GI is not highly documented, and I have not been able to get a lot of data on this. But what I was being able to get is Darjeeling. You see, 
The source of Darjeeling is so well controlled that when the production of Darjeeling falls inside India, the prices of Darjeeling tree is raised across the globe. Just shows how tight the supply chain is. At one point, 90 kg of Darjeeling tea in India fetched around 40 lakhs. In UK, which is about 45,000 rupees per kg. Imagine, are we drinking tea for 45,000 rupees per kg? Look at the source control of Darjeeling. Look at the price control of Darjeeling. Okay. How? Because they track it, they place their logo, they ensure that there is a supply chain control. Some of the newly formed GIs are also started doing this very carefully and they ensure that, you know, the GI registration and the products are available only at certain unique stores. I would like to pick the Rasagulla and Rasagullar. One is by Odisha and one is by Bengal for this to see how you can see. They say that in the shop, a GI based Rasagulla is available. See it in Calcutta. It's a newly formed GI. Okay. And in, but however, in many other places, people are unable to benefit from as to the GI that they have already obtained. I want to show a picture. Some people do have a GI, but look at the artisan. But India has several GI stores. Okay where the authenticity is available, and this is a premium price. Where do we want our people to be? This is a call that we take as a community. I want to, you know, talk about Darjeeling, as to how they manage their GI and trademark, one of the best managed, spread over so many thousands of extra, they make a lot of tea. They have 87 tea estates, lacks of workers, predominantly women, and main economic activity of the area. And they have exported a lot. If you see the literature, it recognized Darjeeling tea from 1830s. Okay. A tea in 19. 30s and 53s, they have made, you know, laws and it culminated in the Tea Act. In 60s to 80s, they have made a tea board with all authority. They were able to control all production. They were the first people when, you know, India had accession to trips. They were the first people to recognize GI and Darjeeling tea is filed as GI number one and two. All Darjeeling cultivators are authorized users. Not only that, they went starting from 2007, they sued people misusing Darjeeling, including the Darjeeling perfume in France, somebody had misused. Okay, they went across and sued everybody across the globe. They, whatever money they got, it was held by this Apex body tea board. They went and sued for you know, misuse of the mark, dilution of the mark, enforce the mark across the globe. There were perfumes by the name of Darjeeling in France. They went and stopped them. They did this across, you know, globe. So now everybody is scared to use the word Darjeeling. So the GI Darjeeling tea has now transposed into the brand Darjeeling. And anybody who sees the TPIC logo, they know what it is. What is happening to our own Naga GIs? I've checked the records. We have a Naga Mircha, we have a Naga Tomato. Okay, there are a few authorized users for Naga Mircha and Naga Tomato. We have a few authorized users for Chekis and Shovels. But have we converted our GI product into brands yet? We need to think about this and start converting our brands, our GI names to brands and ensure that, you know, there is a lot of income which is generated from it. There is a difference. If you see in GI, GI covers only 
certain classes. These classes are associated with certain brands, you know, certain goods. So if you have classes 1 to 35, which is common to trademark and GI, you have different goods and each class will follow one code each. So you have to cover file across the code. Say, for example, this is, you know, a whiskey, so you will cover it in alcoholic beverages. Or if it is handicrafts, you will cover it in the handicraft classes. If it's food, you will cover it in the classes. But services are not covered in GI. But like in case of Darjeeling, when Darjeeling was fighting, there was a Darjeeling lounge, which is a service because there they serve tea. But you have to build a reputation in such a manner that this reputation is carried across goods and services. There are a lot of international brands such like Scotch who have taken advantage of this provision in the Act to ensure that both services are good, are covered across the GI, and they are able to enforce everybody across. Are we doing it? Look at the state. You know, Darjeeling is a very nice example. Look at the state of some other GIs. We have Fulkari. Okay. The full curry doesn't cover a lot of things. We have now full curry in cushion covers, pillow covers, shoes. Okay, how are we able to stop them? Look at worldly paintings. Okay, it's talking about few paintings in GI. It's there in cloth, it's there in nail art and beauty parlors. How are we able to stop them? Okay, so there lies the power of enforcement. Unfortunately, procuring a GI is the first step. The GI has to be gone to an authorized user and there has to be a registration, there has to be a management, it has to be a whole marketing platform and a technology. Okay, so this is the power of enforcement. When you enforce, you build your reputation for the name across the border, then the people or the end users, the person who buy are assured of authenticity. There is a brand image which is built around it and people will be ready to pay a premium for these products. So we need to build this for all of them. What happened, you know, as I said, Naga Kukimbal shows abandoned, okay? There are many other Naga products which we started for GI, okay? But how fast are we on them? What happened to already registered GIs of Nagaland? How many authorized users are there? Um, how is the supply chain being controlled? What are the marketing steps? Do we have in Kohima and in the Mapo GI stores? What is the income generated? Are we ensuring that our products are available in other GI stores? Have we made a story for every Naga shawl? I know Hapidasa shawl or Fino, Chakisang is only given to kings and other people, but how would other people know? We have to translate this, okay, into marketing strategy. And that's how, you know, we create our GI and transform it into brands make it in, from small-scale industries to large-scale industries and ensure that an income is generated which goes back to our own people so that the quality of lives of people are improved drastically. Okay, I want to conclude in the words of Mother Teresa. I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. It's not possible for me or you, but I'm sure students, friends, families of many people from Nagaland are looking and hearing to this. Each one of us has to think like Mother Teresa and start creating ripples. The ripples should become a stream, a stream to a torrent. And all of us need to be benefited by this particular IPR. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for sharing on socioeconomic impact and benefits of GI. And uh, in particular, we want to thank you for considering us and making us your family. Thank you very much. 
later i think we have more discussion on uh, we will be have more discussion and questions on this uh, particular gi uh, topic uh, we will go to our next speaker on copyright and trademark and its benefit by mr siddhartho devnath scientist c p i c s tech guwahati sir you can take your time thank you so much and uh, i thank uh, dr chitra madam for a wonderful presentation and also sir shikha ma'am and uh, dr panwar sir because the insights of these experts uh, make this uh, whole uh, celebration today very vibrant i thank uh, nagaland state and technology council nastic for having me as a resource person i hope i can share something from my experience i have been in the IP field for almost 12 years now, and uh, going for a further journey, and uh, hope I can contribute something to today's this Vigyan Utsav. The topic given to me is copyright and uh, trademark and their benefits. So it's a uh, almost half an hour program uh, on my side. So I'll try to be very brief. and uh, if there is any question dear participants you may also put it in the chat box i'll try to answer uh, later on or maybe during the program also no problem so let's go to copyright and trademark and their benefits copyright we can define as as a grant of exclusive rights to the original work of an author given for a certain period of time by the government to make copies of the same and prevent its unauthorized use by others copyright leads to something which is known as a right which is given by the government to actually make copies of your work so the grant is such that there are some exclusive rights which the government gives to the creator and the original owner of that copyrightable work so that he and she could actually make copies authentically and at the same time those rights also protect anyone who wants to do some illegal activities like copying those works without proper permission hence we can say uh, a copyright is something a very uh, unique type of right in the whole ip regime which actually boosts and urges you to make copies to a proper permission channel the copyright word actually it is made up of two by words one is copy and one is right so you have a right to copy everything that we do in our day to day lives results in some kind of a copy isn't it as you can see i have put a picture of a photocopier machine and the uh, photocopier machine is used in our office day to day lives everywhere so every time a copy is made in the photocopier machine copyright is triggered if you are going to say take a photocopy of your driving license you are giving the driving license to the uh, operator he or she is doing a photocopy and you get the copy to yourself the, in the paper form when you submit it to a uh, agency who needs your uh, say an id proof then copyright is still intact because that information you have provided that uh, the copy of your driving license that should not be used or not be further copied by anyone without your permission copyright mainly comes uh, usually in case of a literary work and uh, it also started long time ago there is not concrete evidence but we say the chinese built printing presses where we copy different type of work and earlier there were some stone carvings so uh, the kings and the rulers they had to write on carve on the stone and then if you to want to make a copy then you take and carve it again so they made some technology in which we can put some ink and make some copies so this is how the copyright came but the problem was that once you make a raw you know uh, a raw technology by which you can make copies then what happens to the original creator in case of some original work that is how this copyright actually came into existence so that the government will protect the owner the author as we call it in here that his or her work is not copied illegally and he can use or she can use her 
uh, work for making copies. The basic symbology that we use in copyright is that C under a circle. And the pattern is like, first we use the symbol, then we use the year, and then we use the owner of that copyright. Example, uh, where copyright is. For example, this is the program agenda. This agenda has been received from Nestec. Okay, but if we go to the law, if we go to the court today, someone challenges it. Who owns the copyright in this? Okay, now this is being emailed to me. Now, if I distribute it to everyone here and I take some uh, money out of it, I'm doing some commercial activity, then yes, in that case, NASDAQ can stop me because since I've received it from NASDAQ, it's made by NASDAQ. So this program schedule is also owned by NASDAQ. But what about the other cases? What about the Ashok Stam? What about the logo? What about the, who owns them? Accordingly, they are also owned by different kind of parties. But here, since we are not doing any commercial activity, we can freely use such papers if you are used for educational research or purposes like that we are doing a celebrating a big amount. The basic criteria for a copyright is that the work has involved some labor in making this presentation, uh, this uh, presentation of this information, some labor has been involved, right? There has been some discussion, there have been some meetings, who will be the resource person, what will be the time, that is labor. Second is the skill. Skill, what is the arrangement? What will be the time? Who will talk about which and how to arrange the people together so that that will be a good uh, program. That is the skill and originality. This uh, arrangement of the agenda has not been copied from any other state councils previous. Then we found that this is a originality. And thus we can say that this may be a copyrighted book. Now, copyright in India is governed by the Copyright Act 1970 and also its rules 2003. I'll just give an example of, for example, you have this book. What is the copyright thing? Copyright means the text of the book, the thought. Actually, here, if you say copyright is just making copies of the book, that is in the printing press. If you scan it in the PDF, that is also a copy. If you make photocopies, that is also a copy. And here in books, you can see who is a writer here, IP book, uh, Narayanan, sorry, is a very uh, famous writer. So there you can see here, the copyright is given not to the author, but to Eastern Law House Private Limited, which is uh, like a publishing company. Thus, we can say that copyright is not only rests with the owner, it also rests with the publishing company because the publishing company has to make copies, but with the prior permission of the What is the subject matter of copyright? In copyright, we use various kinds of classes of work that we, that we come upon. The first is the literary work. Literary work means anything that is written in some kind of a script on a piece of paper that is a literary and has got some kind of a meaning that is the most important. In any language, in any script you write something, just put in a piece of paper that may be subject matter of copyright. Literary also covers uh, a translations. If you want to translate an English to say in Agamis, that is also uh, a subject matter of copyright. If you want to write a gist or an abstract of a big article, that is also a subject matter of copyright. Head notes in case of a court proceedings. Uh, if you're compiling, uh, say, the, I can say, the annual report of your council, if you're then uh, even setting up question papers, if you're writing something in Facebook, whatever you're writing, it is literary. Thus, it is a subject matter of copyright as long as it satisfies the criteria of the copyright. Next, we can go for artistic work. Artistic work involves anything that relates to art, such as a painting, a sculpture, tallest sculpture, you can say in India. So what do you say? Someone has to own the copyright over it. Someone has made it. It is not that it is made by hand. It may be made by some kind of machines too. But a sculpture is made, so someone has to own the copyright in it because you cannot make small, small, this much small replica of the whole 
uh, the tallest structure and then you sell it on the market without permission. Yes, that is something comes under copyright. But in India, we know we are very lenient. We can buy Taj Mahal uh, replicas and other replicas, but that actually comes under the ambit of the copyright because those are artistic works. If you go to musical works, musical works especially have got three subclasses. The first is the lyrics. Lyrics will come to the, uh, the literary work. So here, there is also vocals, very low vocals. So vocals will go to a different thing that is sound record. So if we can analyze all those things together, you can say and come to one conclusion that a song itself does not have a copy. So why I'm telling you about this musical? Musical refers to the musical notations that we have, such as a piano notations, drum notations, guitar notations, vocal notations that we write. That is the uh, in a sheet of paper. Now that cannot be considered as a literary work because it does not have got scripts of a language, but it is a musical language. So we have a specific class of subject matter of that copyright, which is called as a musical work. And uh, this is mainly done by the composers. If you are in a band, you are composing new songs, then you might be thinking that if I copyright the song, uh, put it in, let's write copyright, it may not even be protected. No. If you are making the new tune, which is very new and original, then that tune has to be written in the form of the musical notations with all the instruments together, maybe one page, two page, 100 pages, it doesn't matter. And then you have to get a copyright. And that will be your musical copyright. After that, if someone steals that, your, uh, you know, copies your music, put it into some videos and something, then what will happen in the court you have to prove that this copyright is being uh, copied. Then you have to show that, yes, this is my copyright record. All the notations, you can decode the notations from the uh, other party. And thus, this is how you can proceed with the musical notation. Next is a computer program. As you can see on the uh, bottom left, I have a small screenshot of the computer program. It's Pascal, C, C++. What are those? Those are just some texts, but has got meaning in a computer language. Similarly, they are also considered as a literary work, but special class is of a computer program. And in that case, we can say a computer program, how do you copyright it? Just you cannot send the program to the copyright office, right? You have to first print out or you have to put all the whole uh, program into some kind of a form, such as a uh, paper or a DVD or a CD. And then you have to compile the computer program and then you will come to a object code. That is what the intermediate code, the compiler of a computer program does. That has got some codes, machine language code. That also you have to print out or put it into a CD. Then you have to send it to copy of the register. Now, when the copy of registers, it looks into what is the source code, that is your computer program, and what is the object code, that is the machine language, uh, the output and then only it runs the copyright. Then if this software, this computer program is being copied by someone others, when you go to the code, you have to show that this is my code. And if this is compiled, this object code is formed. If similar object code is formed from that uh, you know, infringing uh, computer program, then that could be a matter of infringement to be proved. We also have copyright in cinematograph films, that is movies. Here, cinematograph film means a running set of pictures with a frame rate and also an audio together. Remember, an audio together. Uh, and finally, we have sound record. Sound recording is just the recordings of the audio that you have, and we can actually send it to copyright office for recording. Audio could be voice and also some kinds of music. So here, all the pictures that if you're watching a YouTube videos, then there will be a copyright in the video itself. You cannot download and share it. There will be a video, a copyright in the audio. There will be a copyright in the images appearing in the video or the something other. What every If a paper appears, constant on text, that's also a subject matter of copyright. And hence, you can see if you're creating a video, you have to be very careful that those things that are shown in the video should not have a copyright earlier 
or if there is something, you have to take a proper permission from the author. At the bottom, you can see there is a concert going on. So these are also subject matter of copyright, which we call as performer's rights. If someone is performing on a stage, that performer has a copyright and it prevents the audience from recording that session and sharing and using for commercial activity. So it is illegal to record a performance in a show. Yes, as per copyright. After the subject matter of copyright, let's go to the registration part. How can we register copyright? Uh, we have to first compile your work together. That is, if it's a literary work, you have to make a copy of your book. You have to print out the book. That is the book. Then, if you want to register it, you have to fill up a form 14, where it tells who is the author, what is the title, then what are your addresses, and are there any other authors where you have copy, you have, uh, you know, translate? Is it translation or not? Any other authors who will have rights? If two people are writing this book, then one people cannot file the copyright. They have to fight it by ten. So one has to assign the rights. All those things will come in the form fourteen. After that, we have statement of particulars, which will tell all the details about this copywriting. And then later we come to statement of further particulars. If it's a translation, adaptation, and fees is will be minimum 500 rupees for a literary work and it goes up to 5000 rupees for a cinematograph film 2000 rupees for and sound recording after that the application when you are ready with fire having all those things together you file it to the copyright office and you have to send two copies of your work if it's a book send two copies and then the copyright office will put your application for a mandatory waiting period of 30 days, that is one month. After that, it will be examined whether anything is there or not, which is objectionably, if someone has objected to it or any such matters. After that, if everything is okay, then the copyright office will give you a grant of the copyright to this book by sending and issuing a certificate of registration. And along with the certificate, they will send one copy of that book you have sent two copies. One copy, they will send you back. Thus, this is the proof of your copyright registration. Tomorrow, if you have any other infringement case, you have to go to the court. You just have to take this copy given by the copyright office and the certificate to prove that this belongs to you. The term of a copyright is very, very high in comparison to any other IPRs. Once you register any other IPRs, you get, uh, for a limited time, you get the uh, you know, validity of the registration. But in case of copyright, for any kind of a published literary, dramatic, musical, or even artistic work, it exists for the lifetime of the author and another 60 years. Even if the author dies, his descendants, his legal representatives can even enjoy the copyright for another 60 years. So I think you may have some... Uh, sometimes we watch some movies where you see uh, the kids, they don't, they don't do anything, but they you know, uh, have got the uh, royalty from the copyright from their parents. You know? So that is true. Not only it's, uh, it also exists in case of a big, big uh, you know, publishing agencies. And in case of uh, photographs and uh, movies, sound recording, it is 60 years from publication. Publication, it is taken after the uh, the date when it is actually published or disclosed. Now, interestingly, here are 60 years of movies. So those movies we have crossed 60 years, you can actually copy them and use them. There are no other problems. But inside the movies, if there are any literary work, dramatic work, musical work, music, and also artistic work in that movie, they will have copyright for another 60 years, mind you. So you actually cannot directly download and use it for commercial sale. You have to check all the movies that it is devoid of any other other copyrights. And uh, the other like performance and broadcasting rights are which are for about 25 years of uh, well. Interestingly, both published and unpublished work are entitled for copyright. So if this book, I publish it today and after two years, I can also apply for its copyright registration or I can apply fresh before it's Thank you.
the benefits of copyright is due to the different statutory rights that the copyright provides. So once you register, you get a copyright in a book. Say, for example, you get a right to reproduce it in any material form. That is, you can make a PDF, you can scan and make a PDF and you can distribute it or sell it. That is one right. If you read this book, you can make a movie out of this book. That is also allowed in case of a copyright. But others, they cannot do it because there is a right which is called right against infringement which prevents any other person other than you to do any of those things. Now, copying a part or a whole is also considered under copyright. And uh, if you want to translate the book, and interestingly, copyright rights, the sector rights also involve the right to sell, no problem. Also offering to sell. If I put an advertisement in say Amazon or Flipkart that I have got this book, so that also right has been protected by the uh, Copyright Act. Then there are other rights like right to transfer. We can transfer the different rights and also moral rights such as uh, integrity rights and paternity rights, where if you even assign all the rights to the publisher, the publisher cannot change the contents inside. And those are the some other rights. So the benefits of copyright is that once you register a copyright, you get the exclusive ownership in copying it, in changing it, in adaptation, in selling it, and all those things. So those who are even engaged in writing research papers, uh, we suggest you get a copyright because it's very easy. Just take a printout, two printouts of the copyright, file online, and you can send it by post. That is enough. And then you can actually put it to the publishing house who will uh, publish it in the journal. And one small, uh, just a case, very interesting about the copyright infringement. It is a super cassette industries and uh, SCN Sujla channel in 2015. You know, this is Sujla channel is a, you know, a local channel, just like that we have, we have in Assam, Nagaland, and other states. For this local channel, what they do, they take, uh, you know, copies of the original content and they play it in their channel. It is a broadcasting. Broadcasting is also covered under copyright. And then what happened, the owner of these three songs, that is uh, from Dabang, Tere Must, Must Do Nen, from Ready, and uh, from Tanu with Manu. So a complaint was registered in the, the T-Series company. T-Series is the super cassette industries. And they had found, they had, put, they had recorded the channel, which is broadcasting these three songs. And these three songs, the copyright is owned by T-Series. And then they went to file an infringement suit uh, in Delhi HC, and ultimately they won. I think ACS has imposed about five lakh uh, punitive damages to the exchange with the channel. So this is a very famous. You can read it out online. There are many many things how things went there. Uh, so copyright, and in copyright, it's not only the civil laws come into effect. Sometimes repetitive copyright infringement. You can also claim some criminal infringement suits so which is very dangerous and uh, you can land up to jail if you are doing all those uh, activities like this. so this is the first part of uh, about copyright and uh, next i will go to trademarks and okay. the so trademark is a symbol it's a logo it could be a name combination of logo name some kind of a color some kind of figurative element which appears on some goods and by appearance of that you can say that this good is making by made by this company or this good has got this type of certification this is a such like a, a veg or non-veg type of product and all those so these are known as trademarks trademark should be very unique and its criteria is distinctiveness distinctiveness in simple case if you see a brand, say you're buying, say, uh, two kinds of a biscuit charger, if you see the logo of the brand, then you should not be confused that whether this is from this one or this is from this owner. If you are not confused, these two trademarks are distinct. It's very simple. So any kind of customer when going, if you say it also includes, say, you go and buy this thing, you're sending something that he or she should not be actually confused, then those two trademarks are best. Trademarks are written as uh, two kinds of things. One is the R inside a circle and one is a TN. 
if it's an R inside a circle, it means that trademark has been applied to the trademark registry, it has been registered in a registered certificate. TM means it is a trademark which has not yet been registered, but it is a, like a self declared type of a trademark. And the trademark as act is the act of 1999. And uh, interesting, you can see why I put this uh, picture of a cow with an ear tag. Because how the trademark started with such things. Because earlier they say in the uh, romance on the Greece, they use a sword. The sword was very special. So they used to put some logos there. Similarly, so trademarks come from the thing. It's like if you have uh, your cattle, your herd of cattle in the field, then they needs to be earmarked. Earmarked means putting this tag into this ear. So they are starting by, oh, these are my cattle. These are some other, if they also mingle together. So this is the main concept of a trademark. Trademark has got five categories. The first is a word mark. It could be word, letter, numerals, just like you can say Sony, uh, HP, Dell, all those. Then device mark, which could be a combination of word and combination of a uh, design of a logo, any other geometrical figures, but it should be other than a word. It should not be a plane, but have some design like that. Then, uh, such as the Apple logo, you have, then you have got the logo of Suzuki logo, Hyundai logo, those are some kind of a device marks. Color marks are only combination of the colors, such as this, uh, this the Google Chrome, uh, you know, so it also goes into the color marks. Some kinds of our color marks are some uh, channels like rainbow channels. Those are in the combination of only colors because there is no other things in there. Three-dimensional mark is very interesting. The goods that you are selling, you can also claim a trademark over the whole goods. Three-dimensional means all the pictures of the goods you have to give and you can claim a trademark on them. Best example is the Ferrero Rocher chocolate. Ferrero Rocher is a registered trademark in as a three-dimensional mark. The name Ferro Rocher is a word mark that is also plus the whole chocolate that is the brown, you know, the casing and the upper golden part. Everything is under the trademark as a three-dimensional mark. And also sound mark. Sound marks is the ringtones, then the small sound that you have when you turn on your laptop and uh, sound of, uh, you know, uh, the you know, uh, wrist watches and now the smart watches are coming on them. All those things, small, small sounds you can also put under trademark. But here, limitation is about 30 seconds. To file a trademark, you have to use the form TMA, which uh, is contain the mark, such as that uh, HP or Dell or logo, whatever. Then class and description of goods. So where you will use that trademark? Is it a foodstuff? Is it some kind of a service? Is it milk? Is it uh, some kind of an achar? Is it some clothing that you have to describe? And then if you have uh, any kind of a certificates, like you're a startup and small enterprise, you have to give it. If you have been using it for a long time, but now you're going to register it, you have to put an affidavit about its prior use. And then you have to pay a fees of 5,000 for individual startup, small enterprise and 10,000 for others. Once this application is filed, nowadays everything is online in trademark. Uh, that will be checked for a formality if everything is okay or not, or you will require some more information. Then it will be examined by the examiner and published in the trademark journal. If anyone has got any opposition, they can oppose it within a period of three months, extendable up to one month more. After that, if there is no any problem, then the trademark certificate will be issued to it. Along with the certificate will contain your logo or your trademark and the goods where it will use them. From that day, you have got uh, 10 years of time for the trademark. And interestingly, you can um, still renew it after before expiry of the 10th year. From 9th year, you can renew it for another period of 10 years ago. And uh, some benefits of trademarks is it's mainly banning of the goods and services. And uh, customer retention is the main thing of the USP. Uh, originality and counterfeit safety and security in trade. So the example, as you can see, the above part is actually the infringement. So Starbucks coffee is a very famous, well-known trademark. So in Korea, they open such a kind of a coffee shop that you have this logo. So it's a case of an infringement. So Starbucks is protected because they are a registered trademark and also well-known trademark. 
what about in india these two biscuits you can find uh, in the shops this they, they look very similar the biscuits look very similar but the trademark that is one is made from britannia one is from sun that distinguishes and also puts in a security in a trade that yes you know good they will taste like this mom's magic will taste like this so these two trademarks they also protect and also uh, create a safety in the trade of these two of uh, basic companies so some other information such as many types of trademarks are the standard that we have in the logos collective mark if many people use together a trademark certification such as uh, isi certification marks uh, series marks are then if you change a lot of trademarks together many trademarks together can result to one kind of application that is a series mark and uh, interestingly we all say in a trademark i have been doing trademark work a lot we have invented word are the best trademarks you have to invent word make your own word say you take one letter from your uh, surname and other letter from your product and make it then these are the best trademarks so this is all for uh, my presentation from my side i hope uh, i was being able to deliver as uh, expected and uh, thank you for your time and for inviting thank you thank you mr siddhartho uh, for your presentation on copyrights and trademark and its benefits uh, we will come to you later and now we will continue with our next presenter overview of ip in nagaland by ms giu kalichi you can take your time Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking on the topic of overview of intellectual property rights in Nagaland. Well, the former speaker have already talked about uh, all forms of IPR, but I'll just give an overview of what IPR is. So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property rights are the rights given to person over the creations of the minds. They usually give the creator an exclusive rights over the use of his or her creation for a certain period of time. In other words, we can say that uh, the legal rights, these legal rights prohibit all others from using the intellectual property for commercial purpose without the prior consent of the IP rights holder. It is an intangible property. Intangible means uh, we cannot touch, feel, or see, but it adds value to a product. And uh, yeah, it, it adds value to it adds value to your uh, business, and it can refers to a creation of mind, uh, refers to creation of the mind. It can be an inventions that is product or process, literary and artistic works, design, symbol names, logos, etc. IP are largely territorial rights, and it can be assigned, gifted, sold, and licensed like any other property. IP is time bound, so you have to renew from time to time to keeping them in force. And this is the only right uh, which can be simultaneously enjoyed in more than one country. So, why intellectual property rights in Nagaland context? Well, Nagaland has a rich diversity of ethnic groups, languages, religions. 
climate and landscapes and home to 18 recognized tribes with each distinct and fascinating culture. And Nagaland being one of the richest states in flora and fauna, IPR lacks its root in many areas which are considered to be the hotbed for IPR filing, such as geographical indication, patents, traditional knowledge documentation, etc. But uh, many people are still unaware about IPR and their advantages in taking rights for their intellectual property. So slowly, slowly, people are infringing our indigenous and traditional rights. And we since time immemorial, the indigenous traditional system has been passed on from generation to generation orally without any written document, written documentation. And that is why various indigen indigenous traditional knowledge and bioparacy methods are gaining the significance in the legal story of the country due to lack of proper documentation and an awareness of the IPR related issues among the local people. And this is where the PIC is trying to promote uh, IPR awareness among the local people so that they know about what is IPR and how to protect the traditional uh, knowledge system. And at present, uh, cultural appropriation has greatly contributed to the endangerment of indigenous community and society. And this has been a matter of concern for a long time in the Noga society. Maybe, the, maybe due to because of lack of awareness and also a silent spectator on the part of the society has given a free access to our Naga cultural items and attires and uh, traditional knowledge of system of medicines as well. And alarmingly, alarmingly, indigenous people are exploited through misappropriation in the number, in the name of culture promotion and appreciation. Uh, many a times we have come across our Naga, uh, our Naga attires has been misused and uh, in the name of culture promotion and appreciation. And uh, it's so unfortunate, uh, unfortunate that it has been uh, misused by our own Naga designers as well. So uh, I'm sharing this screen. You can uh, you can see in the picture. Uh, all I asked was, can I patent my copyright trademark? So uh, in our office, we come across so many inventors, uh, so many interested individuals who come for asking for filing for uh, copyright or trademark. They refer the term as patenting. Every word, every term they use as patenting, they get confused with the word patent or the copyright or trademark. So. Um, uh, people are still ignorant about kinds of IPR. So the former speaker have already talking about the various types of IPR, but these are the types of IPR that is patent, trademark, copyright, industrial design, plant variety, trade secrets, layout design, geographical indication. So I won't be going into detail, but uh, I'll just give an overview of what is copyright. It is a, a type of intellectual property that gives its owner the exclusive rights to make copies of a creative form and is intended to protect the original expression of an idea in the form of a creative work. It can be a literary works, uh, dramatic, music and artistic work, motion pictures, audiovisual works, cinematograph films, and sound recordings. So every IPR has a time bound, and in case of literary work, is protection of uh, protection is lifetime of the honor plus 60 years. In case of artistic work, the term is 60 years. Broadcasting, the term is for 25 years. What is trademark? Trademark can be any device, brand, heading, label, ticket, name, signature, word, letter, numeral, shape of goods, packaging, or combination of colors, or any combination thereof. So trademark helps you to distinguish the goods and services of one person from those of others. The term of protection is 10 years and can be renewed indefinitely by paying renewal fees. Industrial design. An industrial design is an IP right that protects the visual design of an object. So uh, it uh, protects the appearance and appearance or aesthetic features of a product. It makes an article attractive and appealing, which adds to the commercial value of a product and increases its marketability. It can relate to a feature of shape, configuration, lines of colors, pattern, ornaments, composition of lines of colors applied to any article in 2D or 3D or both forms. The term of protection is initially for a period of 10 years and can be renewed for another five years by paying renewal fees. 
So uh, this is just an example of an industrial design of a Coca-Cola bottle. So this Coca-Cola bottle, it started in 1899 and till date, you can see the uh, physical appearance of a Coca-Cola being changed, but it is all protected under industrial design. And in this case, uh, this is a very, very uh, famous case between iPhone and uh, Samsung smartphone. So this Samsung and uh, Samsung and Apple, uh, they had a court, they sued against each other in more than 10 countries and the case uh, was for 11 years. And some, you can see in the picture, uh, Samsung smartphones, they appeared before iPhone and with that uh, designs, the physical uh, appearance design and after, uh, after Samsung, Apple iPhone was introduced in January 2007 uh, with a protected uh, design. And you can see in the last picture, Samsung smartphones, they have copied a similar type of designs to, uh, from Apple. So they had a case between each other in more than 10 countries and the damages were awarded to Apple of $539 million. So you should be very careful in uh, using someone's protected design. If he or she wants to use, the company wants to use the similar type of design that they have to get a permission from the uh, respective owner. Uh, next is layout design of integrated circuits. Layout design of an integrated circuit re refers to essentially to the three-dimensional character of the elements and interconnection of an integrated circuit. So integrated uh, circuit rights are simply IP rights that aims to protect the original layout design for integrated circuits and computer chips. And it can include a layout of transistors and other circuitry elements and include leads wire connecting such elements. So the term is 10 years from the date of filing. Plant variety protection and farmers' rights. It is a system for protection of plant varieties, the rights of farmers and plant breeders, and to encourage the development of new varieties of plants. So it acts as a certification of registration for a variety and acts as an exclusive right on the breeders or his successor, his agent, or licensee to produce, sell, market, distribute, import, or export the variety. So in case of trees and vines, the term is 18 years from the date of registration. In extant varieties, 15 years from the date of notification, and in other cross, 15 years from the date of registration. These are some examples of uh, plants variety protected. Uh, this product, the golden variety of custard apple, uh, got uh, plants variety protected, and it was produced by Solapur Best Farmer Navnat Kaspati. And in the next picture, the groundnut, Diraj 101 groundnut, was developed by Diraj Lal Tumar, and it is also protected under plants variety protection. Next is threat secret. So threat secret is IP rights that is a confidential information which uh, may be sold or licensed. And it can be formula, pattern, business information, customer information, methodology, strategic plans, etc. And it has a commercial value and only known to a limited group of persons. And it has it has no uh, time bond, it's unlimited duration as long as it's a secret. And uh, it is automatically granted, no legal action required. So you can see in the picture, uh, the famous threat secret, threat secret is KFC uh, recipe. This KFC recipe consists of 11 herbs and spices, uh, which was uh, written, uh, de developed by Gar uh, Garner Harlan Sanders in 1940s. And this handwritten recipe is stored in a bank protected in such a way that other companies, other competitors wouldn't know of it. And the next uh, picture is a Coca-Cola. The, uh, Coca -Cola, the formula of Coca-Cola is a threat secret. And it has also been a threat secret since uh, 
since 18th century and uh, in one cases in 2006 a coca-cola employee and his two accomplices have tried to sell the coke recipe to pepsi but uh, unfortunately uh, the two the three people were caught uh, were caught by the police because the pepsi notified to the coke regarding they were trying to sell the trade secrets to uh, Pepsi company. So they are protected in such a way that it is not the, they have to sign a non disclosure agreement that they will not reveal their spread secrets to others. So patent. Uh, exclusive rights granted by a government to an inventor or applicant to make use and sell an invention for a specified number of years. It prevents others from making, using, selling or distributing invention without your permission. So criteria should be novel, inventive and capable of industrial application. So patents are territorial rights. Territorial rights means you can file in any parts of the any uh, other country. And uh, the term is 20 years from the date of filing. I'm not going into detail in all these uh, patents, trademark, copyright, and uh, trademark, since the former speaker have already spoken in detail. And geographical indication. Geographical indication is a name or a sign used on certain products which corresponds to a specific geographical location or origin and possesses qualities of or reputation due to that geographical origin. And it acts as a certification that the product possesses certain qualities and is met according to traditional methods or enjoys a certain reputation due to its geographical origin. Duration of protection is 10 years and every 10 years you have to renew it. So we have uh, four GI from Nagaland, that is Naga Mercha, Naga Tree Tomato, Chakasang Shoals, and Naga Cucumber. This was recently granted in uh, September 2021. So we have four GI from Nagaland. Uh, this is... Uh, it's just citing an example like um, the traditional attires of our Naga people have been misused uh, in big in big platforms in fashions uh, without without giving acknowledgement to the owner without taking the permission from the society it has been misused inappropriately so uh, due to due to the occurrence of these such cases uh, the naga people are now they are waking up to, to file for gi in all the traditional attires of the other tribes and this is also another a case of uh, chagasang shawl being misused by designer ritu Berry, and uh, she has uh, showcased her this fashion in Suraj Kant, Mela, and uh, Haryana last, last year on February. And uh, this Chakasang shawl is a GI shawl. And the, she has not uh, she has not taken the permission from the Chakasang Women Welfare Society, who is the owner of this shawl. So it has uh, really hurt the sentiments of the Chakasang community and the Nagas as well. Since these shawls, has a significant meaning behind it and it is a taboo to use by everyone and it has been showcased in the uh, in the in this kind of events without giving a proper acknowledgement to the owner or gift or giving or taking permission from the owner so the chagasan women welfare society has filed a lawsuit against strifit and designer ritu berry and this case is still ongoing So I'll come to the uh, activities of what our patent information center is uh, going on. So we have uh, we were established in 2011, and it's the only organization in Nagaland dealing with IPR issues. Uh, this was set up by the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and PIC is the nodal coordinator for IPR in the state, and also coordinator under Department for Promotion of Industry and Inter Internal Trade, Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Our objectives of the center is to uh, create awareness programs and consultation resource person among the people in the state to facilitate universities, industry, government department, and art institution for patent filing and searches, chair registration, copyrights, new plant varieties, etc. 
uh, we also set up IPR cells in universities and our Institute of Higher Education. We provide free patent searches. So five IPR cells has been set up. That is NU Said Dimapu, Patkai Christian College, Nagar University, Kwame Science College, and Department of Industries and Commerce. So our annual activities are we create awareness programs and IPR to schools, colleges, NGOs, entrepreneurs, departments, farmers, etc. And we also go as a, a resource person to the um, on the event as well as we invite guest speakers uh, for IPR awareness workshop. We facilitate in patent filing and searches, GI registration, copyright, trademark, new pen varieties, etc. We also carry out patent search through procure database and we conduct post GI awareness workshop. Since we already have 4GI, but uh, we see that people are still unaware of what is this, what uh, this GI, GI, the granted GI can do. So we have been creating GIS, GI awareness workshop to the uh, farmers, to the entrepreneurs, and to the local people. So we have we conducted patent search for around 20 innovators, and we have been guiding innovators in copyright and trademark filing. So these are some of the annual activities of PIC. Uh, these are the activities which we have given an awareness workshop in the NABAT, in the schools, in the colleges. These are the activities which we have performed and the awareness workshop which we have uh, done in uh, Loin Loom Festival. We have set up an IPR cell as well as in the startup programs. We have visited schools and colleges for the workshop. These are the workshops conducted on IPR for the colleges. And uh, we also conduct webinar seminar during the pandemic. So these are some of the webinars uh, we have conducted during the pandemic. And we have also conducted IPR camps. And the post GI awareness workshop we have conducted in a modern uh, free district. And we also conduct state level workshop where uh, our eminent resource person, uh, the former speaker, Dr. Arvind Chitra is also uh, has, uh, has been a resource person for our state level workshop. And other activities like we have uh, documentation on Naga traditional attires, designs, motifs, ornaments, and GI taking of 18 inhabited tribes of Nagaland in collaboration with Nagaland Handloom Handicraft Development Commission Limited as the implementing agency. And PIC is acting as a facilitator and providing technical uh, assistance. And uh, due to the heavy exploitation of our Naga attires by outsiders, the government of Nagaland with the initiatives of our uh, uh, chief minister has taken a key interest in filing of GI of all tribes of Nagaland in traditional attires. So uh, this is the ongoing documentation which we are, the PIC is trying to facilitate all the uh, 18 tribes of Nagaland in getting a GI tag. We had an orientation program on documentation for the researchers uh, for this documentation on traditional attires. Uh, they were taught how to write, a, how to uh, read, do a research on the traditional attires and do a documentation so that in the later time we can file for GI of all 18 tribes. So right now we are uh, documenting on the traditional attires, motifs, designs and ornaments. And in the second phase, we are trying to document on the handicraft so that the handicraft also can go for filing of GI and get it protected. So in conclusion, uh, intellectual property rights are monopoly rights that grant temporary privileges to all the holders for the exclusive exploitation of income rights from cultural expressions and inventions. So understanding the country's IP rights and following the best practices can reduce the risk of losing one's own protected property. Thank you.
thank you, Gyori, uh, you got it, you see, for that wonderful presentation. And now we are on to the uh, discussion session. And any participant, any participants can ask any question. But I'll start off with a question. Uh, already, you have already highlighted uh, the question will ad uh, address to our three speakers, uh, Madam Jitra and Sir Devnath and uh, and Shikara Sogi. Uh, the recent visit of our uh, finance minister has stressed on the issue of trademark and branding of organic uh, products. So how and who should do this and uh, how should we do this? Uh, th that one we are asking. Uh, first, I think our man Chitra can answer that a bit. The trademarks, first we have to understand what are the products whether you know they are uh, something which is new or which is old okay if it is new like you know something which you have made right now and it's like a company and then we should go for trademarks otherwise if it's going to be on traditional knowledge i would recommend that first you file it as a gi and take a collective mark as a trademark and use it for your community so the word organic alone will not suffice. The word which you have to check whether it is traditional or modern. Okay, thank Dr. you, Dr. Devnath, you would like to add something to it? Yes, ma'am. I completely agree with you. Uh, and also, uh, regarding the marks, actually, from Nagaland, we have got a lot of products from there. And... Uh, especially Naga Mircha products are in Assam also that we are also buying, but there is no actually the GI, uh, you know, that uh, authorization is not there. there. There are no authorized users too. But uh, till we can have some authorized users, uh, just like Ma'am said, yes, uh, the collective mark can also give a good amount of protection to this. And also may, we may have some uh, a certification mark also regarding the uh, Naga King Chili because uh, the chili, we don't get it in uh, the shops here, but we get the achar of the chili. So there in the achar, if we can have a certification, some kind of a related to the GI application, then I think uh, the people from Nagaland can have uh, a lot of benefits out of it. So that will be my submission. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, my question is, who should be doing all this uh, GI regarding the organic products? Again, it has to be product by product. The If it is a GI, the registered user is supposed to do it. Okay, at least, you know, earlier it was such that, you know, the authorized user had to take permission from the registered user. It is not so anymore. People can apply for authorized users separately. But the registered user has to make effort to contact the authorized user, ask them, Okay, tell them that this is my GI, this is the knowledge which is associated with GI, this is the mark. So please, you know, use this mark. And all these things have to be, you know, contractual. So the registered user has to take this effect, uh, effort to contact authorized users and, you know, control the supply chain. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um... Yeah, uh, may I add something about this? Regarding the GI application, we are we have in Assam also, we've got a lot of GI applications. And uh, what we are doing now is that uh, when we get a GI application we are working on, we are holding a meeting of all the GI stakeholders together. For example, we are doing on Assam tea now. So it will be special uh, only for CTC. So we are calling all the tea industry people together and this work, this initiative can be done by the PIC only, the PIC, in our case PIC ASTEC and in your case PIC NASTEC. So if they call a meeting from the government, from the private, then uh, the associations, and then you held a meeting with discussing that we want to go for GI, this and that, then who will be the applicant? Because in GI, we know an association of persons is the best applicant. If it's a government, there is a problem with fund and maintenance. If it's a private, there is a problem with, you know, they will take over all the GI capturing type of problems. 
so if we can do some meeting because we are doing currency and it has been very fruitful then uh, when someone comes forward then we decide their credibility based upon the minutes that we draw from the meeting and then later on we say that yes this will be the applicant we will get it to approval of the government also and then the applicant comes into some kind of a binding uh, that the applicant has to be do mane the do business and also issue consent letters register authorized users uh, under the welfare of the people so i think that uh, your answer that sir has asked me who will be the applicant i think you can make some uh, meetings like that and design the parties who are actually working i think that will be one of the best suggestions thank you very much sir yeah. uh, we have uh, understood yeah uh yeah in between i just want to come in yeah uh thank you to both of you for highlighting this issue but i have one concern here i mean like uh um madam chitra you have highlighted that um regarding for the user registration now the new clause has been added that where the user doesn't need a permission from the proprietor anymore so i'm a little bit skeptical here in case without the um uh without the permission <clears throat> from the proprietor if everybody start re re registering and if they start selling the product without the knowledge of these people then what will be the yeah wouldn't there be some conflict there the authorized user is supposed to follow all the rules and sell as per what is present in the gi application they are supposed to use the logo which is there in the gi application yeah. okay so if the authorized user even if they are independently registered is not doing this then the registered user has to send notice to the authorized user okay so we have to ensure that the authorized user is doing this the onus still rises on the registered user but we have to keep track of what is happening yeah because that case <clears throat> for the chakasan show the proprietor the uh, uh the authorized proprietor is the cwws but now recently the trifect they have registered as one of the user and it's not in the knowledge of the pic nor with the uh, cwws so there is it is updated yeah. in the site okay and trifect yeah. is a authorized user there yes i have seen that i say wws has to approach trifect and understand because till the registered user has the right they has to they have to ensure that these are the rules in which trifect follows there has to be written communication to tell trifect that this is what is expected out under gi in records okay and if trifect does not follow that then we have a cause of action but okay. see a gi is otherwise you know a gi gets diluted we don't want you know the authorized user to do a passing off but it is necessary for the registered user to be cognizant okay we have to make attempts to give rules we have to give attempts to regulations okay so if there are many producers it only help but you need to collate your supply chain ensure that anything which comes out of a certain place is forming a certain quality this is the place if you there is a inspection body in your gi application okay so this inspection body has yes. to take a lot of precedence the inspection body has to be very active it cannot just be on the paper so if there are two or three sources where your gi is going to reach the market the inspection body has to ensure that everything that goes is authentic there is a logo which is placed and there are no you know uh, passing off or spurious products there in the market okay this requires team work this requires community knowledge but uh, yeah. again i would request the registered user to make a draft email and reach out to the authorized users for every gi this is going to be true for every gi that you own thank you ma'am uh, any other questions All from right, the participants yeah 
yeah and um uh, regarding this gi now in nagaland we have four gi so uh uh my question here is how do we trade the path yeah uh, that is how do we trade the market linkages how do the farmers get all uh, benefits uh, of this gi product because um Siddhar also was mentioning that we in Nagaland we have uh, GI uh, the Nagamercha which is already GI tech, but the farmers are not getting benefit of uh, uh, fitting. So in fact, yeah, the GI uh, the GI Mercha that is going to Assam and it's promoting in that uh, in the other brand name and all. So how do we the producer the farmers get benefits? What is the path that we should create? in order the farmer to have the uh, avail the uh, be benefits. Uh, Dr. Devnath, you want to take yes, the second add-on? Yes, yes. Uh, the thing is that, uh, Madam, I'll just share what we have done for Muga Silk. No? The one thing is that once you register a GI, uh, even like your state, our state, no, the people who are actually manufacturing, they will never come to your office. They will never come forward practically to get themselves registered yeah. as authorized users. I think we have to take the first step. Example, we have done some GI authorized user registration camps. So we take out from some, some dedicated fund and we uh, do some workshop where we go visit them, find out who are actually doing the work and then sensitize them beforehand. And then one day we held a meeting and in the meeting, we take all their credentials and then we draft their authorized user application, including fees and everything, and then we send it to GI register. Because since it happens through the authorized um, the registered proprietor, so we only verify it at the uh, at our end. So then the GI registry does not object it. In this way, initially, we had registered about 14, 30 like the registrations. And uh, there was a mass drive that was created by Tejpur University where that registered is almost like 70 and another 70 type of. After that, when it is popularized a little bit, I think, ma'am, it automatically comes. But now, currently, in case of Muga, we are not doing any, uh, you know, GI camps still now. But people are coming. Every year, we are getting three, four uh, people coming. They are getting registered. Then sometimes uh, the government tells that this is a program we go and tell. We get 10 to 20 people from there. So I think initially, Madam, we have to give a kick, <laughs> have to take an uh, account about uh, spending our own money and all those things. The registered proprietor has to take a step. And then and there's none, and no other department in, in our case, our concerned department is say, uh, directorate of sericulture. If sericulture, if they tell the people to come to Aztec to register as an authorizer, they will not come. So we have to go there and do some work from ourselves, get some people registered. Then only, Madam, I think the authorized users will come. And regarding the branding, what is coming on, so uh, those people who are getting registered, we have been in uh, constant contact with them. We uh, When they sell something and when there is recently now, there is a GI fair going on. People are calling me from all over that we want to participate. Then you do this form, you fill up this form, you need GST and all those things. Madam, this extra work has to be done by the registered proprietor. They will not do themselves. So I think it is a, uh, even though people say that being a registered proprietor of a GI is a proud thing, but I think there is a very much, very much work at the backside that we are doing. And for this, I think we can have a success of... Uh... Yes, um... Uh, to uh, add on, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Devnath made a very valid point. To add on to this, uh, ma'am, first you need to generate funds. Okay, once you generate funds, you need to have a mechanism for disbursement of funds to the producers. Okay, so why would the producers come to you if you don't give them something a little bit plus? Okay, either it is a premium price, or say, for example, it is a safety mechanism or a net. Like, you know, uh, in Tirupati, that's a temple. In, okay, that's a famous temple in Atra. There are a lot of people go there to pray and shave their heads. Okay, so even though it's not a GI, but, you know, the use of the hair for producing enzymes and everything are there, 
they're the people, the barbers, okay? They have a safety net, they have a pension, they have a retirement age. Okay, so these are safety nets that we give to people. Okay, so tomorrow, say for example, you have a source from a plant source from which you take, you know, the plant and make the shawl. Supposing there is a that plant source has been destroyed or something. Okay, so those shawls cannot be made. Do you have a safety net of a cultivation of those plants, you know, both to save the environment? Or if a person or if a lady is not able to make any shawls, do we have, you know, some mechanism to tell her that you will be taken care of in your bad times? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah. We have uh, Vipa Jane. And, uh, we, we have Vipa Jane raising his hand. Uh, sir, you have any question? You can ask the question. Vipa Jane. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are audible. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is, uh, can a software on a or an algorithm which can perform better result or a, or have a different uh, result can be like a copyright or, or patented? Uh, actually, a software in case of India, software if you say per se if it's a computer program, you can go for only copyright, not patent. But if the software is kind of embedded with kind of hardware then some methods, that is the algorithm in the software, may be patented. So this is a, depends on the trick and the, you know, the ability of the attorney or the agent how to write it. But normally, no software is uh, patentable in India. But I'm giving an example. Software relates to, I think you are maybe talking about apps, uh, the Android apps, then uh, iStore, Apple apps. So those apps, we have facilitated a lot. All you need to do is, in case of an Android, you need to get the uh, the source program. It is written in Java class. So you need to get the Java class. And then all those programs, you have to make it into a readable document or a file. And then you have to compile them and also get the object code. All those two things together, along with your app, that is the APK, you burn it into a DVD and send to Copyright Office for registration as a software port. And then they will keep one copy, they will return you one copy, then this is how you get the registration. And in case of patents, if you're developing a software which is required for your invention to function, for example, say the washing machines, they have got an embedded system into it. Uh, so those in that case, you can also claim that there will be uh, a sensor which is controlled by the amount of water that will be in the water level and this triggers uh, you know the inlet of the water outlet of the water like that the writing of the claims that also you can fit in the, some software related inventions we call it as uh, CRIs computer related invention there is a manual also in the patent office website you can check it out sir uh, if the source of information is being obtained by uh, some uh, government agency using the uh, APIs uh, and then uh, uh, using those uh, data and processing it and uh, using, my, uh, using the algorithm and which can perform a better result, so uh, those things, uh, uh, it can be copyright or not. My, my question was that. Yes, yes, yes. You can copyright them, no problem. But one thing is that even in the government work, those who have actually created their work, you have to take an NOC from them. For example, if someone is uh, third party, you are giving the money or outsourcing it to make the software, and then they are making it and all the APIs, they will submit to it. But you have to take an NOC from them, and then you can uh, file for the copyright. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah, um, one, uh, before we wind up, I just have a small request to the... Uh, 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 Devnath and Chitra. Uh, recently, yeah, we have facilitated and we have done some user registration of the GI. So now I feel that this, the GI user, I mean, the business model has to come up. So yeah, very soon, uh, yeah, if you can kindly guide in this, that will be very helpful to the farmers. Yeah, thank you. You can take it first, Dr. Devnath. You yes, have yes. practical experience. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, business model is that, ma'am, what you can do is that the bunch of authorized users that you have, you need to promote them. 
for example, today you are at Opal. So there, uh, take some products from those uh, things. I know it's, it's it may be a little bit unofficial. You are not going to sell it, but for sample distribution type. Right? If there is any program in your uh, private program, a government program, please call the uh, resource, the authorized users. You have to pay their TADA. So this is the initial, you have to do it better. Once they will come to know about that, yes, these and these things, you can sell it over there, then their business model automatically comes up. And next, uh, I can suggest one thing. You can organize some kind of a, uh, that, uh, a festival type, small festival, that GI festival uh, yes. of Nagaland, where you can about showcase, showcase all the GIs, and then you call all the authorized users to put their stall. So there is there will be a condition that only authorized users can put their shawls. Regarding the price, they can fix, uh, I think you can fix a price ahead about 10 to 15% ahead because it is a GI product. So by using that, madam, I think you can build up a small business model and publicize it. That I think will have a good start. Over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. What I also say is there are some mechanisms which are available at GI stores. Okay, there is, you know, a state owned stores for, stores for various states. Okay, ensure that we have tie up with this state owned stores and also GI stores. Your product is available. See, while we understand the sensitivity of the shawls, okay, and inside Nagaland, that sensitivity is well known, but we need to educate other people also. So for every shawl that you want to have a sensitivity, please write a small story about the shawl, okay, that this is to be worn by women, this is to be worn by, you know, people of the society. Like your Hapidasa shawl that I understand is worn, worn only by people who reach a a certain status in the society in those days kings but in nowadays you know people with a very great you know achievements so price it accordingly see people who have very great achievements uh, would have made their money or their name in the society so if somebody wants to present somebody or tell them that like you are the king or you know we understand that you have done it price that shawl for uh, higher value okay so and you have a story for it so that you know it's your uh, authenticity also does not get diluted and our emotions also don't get hurt so that you know you say three lakhs four lakhs five lakhs for that shawl so which means that not everybody is going to own that shawl like your pashmina okay so for some shawls which are worn by bachelors uh, to attract girls or, you know, or young girls to show that, you know, they are not yet married, price it differently, okay? And you tell that, you know, you can even write, it's lucky that you will get married. So people who want, you know, that's writing language. And that's language is what you need to get it protected by copyright. Okay, so those pamphlets, those leaflets, you put your Chaki song logo into it, okay? so. Are your products which are going out, going out with a logo sewn, uh, sewn on the shawl or not? Okay, so if you have a logo and it is sewn on the shawl, then we will be able to identify the origin. You put a packet and put a sticker on the packet. I tear the packet and throw it. Your logo goes along with it. Okay, so and is there any way to trace that your logo is the authentic logo? Okay, so these are things that you can think through. Okay, so once we know that this is a source, then it becomes easy for us to enforce products and enforce a logo for what is not there in the source. Okay, so if we have people to appreciate what our shawls are, we have to educate them. Okay, within your community, your grandfather must have taught you, you will teach your children. But outside your community, we need to educate, we need to take the pains to do that. <clears throat> For people who have Hapidasa shawl and who can afford it, or I want to gift it to my father who's reached, no reached a status in life, and I'm willing to spend that three lakhs, I want to give it as a gift, you know. So what is your packing? How is it packed? 
Okay, and how do I translate that significance to him? These are things that, you know, you have to think through. Okay, look for a marketing personnel along with, you know, all your workshops and everything. And this needs to be uh, taken on a very um, serious note. Have some rules, regulations and passed on to community. Okay, thank yeah, you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you for the inputs. Uh, I think if there is no further questions, we will end this uh, last session of our celebration on Vigyan Utsaf. Um, we want to thank especially the SSTP division, uh, DST, Government of India, for letting us host this last event. And we also, in particular, want to thank our Sir Dr. Yashwant and Dr. Shikha Rostogi, Dr. Chitra Arvin, and Mr. Siddhartho Devnath, in particular, for giving us a good uh, presentation today. And uh, we want to thank all the participants in this uh, event, and thank you all. The recording has stopped.